right now, uh, being summer, we have, the interesting thing is we still have many homeless people coming to us. It's almost like weather, you know, doesn't make much of a difference. It does at times, but uh, summertime we still have many people coming to us um, because, you know, we take in everyone. We don't refuse anyone. And police are still bringing homeless people to us. Uh, hospitals are sending homeless people to us. Um, and other agencies are sending homeless people to us. Um, we're finding that because of the uh, economy, the system that we're constantly fighting uh, is working against our people rather than helping them and lifting them up. It just buries them into the ground. Uh, so we have many people coming to us for rent. Uh, their utilities are shut off. They can't afford their prescriptions. Um, some still aren't seeing doctors. We have to set that up. Uh, we're we're uh, working on getting our people that come to us that are homeless into apartments. Um, and we have Kevin and Ryan who really are doing a good job at that. Uh, they really work, uh, and CW works very hard at that also, uh, getting people into apartments. And what we're finding is that, uh, that getting them into apartments doesn't mean that they're going to be successful at it in the beginning because they're not used to being in apartments and we have to get um, the landlords and uh, the realtors to understand that getting a person, a homeless person, into an apartment is a major adjustment and there are mental issues you have to deal with and other issues that need to be dealt with and so very often um, they, Kevin, Ryan, and CW have to go back and negotiate again with the uh, the owner of of the building. Well, you know, well, we got a lot of our people in the new Sun House on Joseph Avenue, and three of them have been evicted already. Two of them we saved. Uh, one of them was Brian, who's a mute, and one of the girls who had gotten evicted from Sun House. He's just a gullible person. She moved all of her furnaces and everything into his apartment. She didn't turn enough fob, so she was using that to gain entry to the building, and he was almost to get evicted. We had to go back and reevaluate his case, put him back and have her 30 days notice to leave. And hers was a simple case that just goes to show you what drug addiction and mental illness does for you. Had she had just come to us, Ryan and I put several feelers out to get him to come to us mm. to save her apartment. And all she had to do was take a trip down to 187 West, West Main Street and show her ID and identification card and present a social security number. That would have been brought into a line, a line with a reduced rent and the federal government would have paid the other part of it. While she and a few others didn't comply. And that's what happened. And I said to the girl, Michelle, who runs the operation, that should be done at entry level. Because it's hard enough to get enough information to put our people into perspective to, to be in compliance. So let's not do it in segments. Let's try and do it all in one block. Then when the person is in there, all the bases are covered. Then we have to go through the necessary requirements because they have been used to living in a community where there's uh, several people, and to put them in an apartment where they're just isolated among themselves, and sure they're going to invite their friends in, and their friends going to take advantage of them, because number one they're mentally ill, number two they're possibly drug addicted, and their case managers are not following their case as close as they should, and that's what happens. So, yeah. but with that being said, our city in our county a part and parcel for being responsible for these people the way they are in the first place. Because as you know, and I always say this about when I talk to people, when they close Rochester Psych Center on Homewood on Avenue and put people out in communities 30, 35 years ago, the youth is a product of it. They're not crazy, I mean they're not criminals, they're just mentally ill, and some of them physically and mentally ill. And you tie all that together with the over-the-counter drugs they're already receiving, and now they introduce the street drugs, what do you got? You got a time bomb on your hand. And with the homeless situation, we got, we've been working on this for, since we moved here in 1994. Mm -hmm. We've been going to the county regarding that. Mm -hmm. And each year, 
late fall, they listen. Early well, spring. Yeah, why do you think that is? Why do you think they listen to late fall? Well, because it, to them, I think it's a political ploy to say, well, okay, we'll see what we can do when the weather breaks, weather permitting. And my question is always down to them is, you're talking about future, what you're going to do. What are we going to do in the interim? Mm -hmm. Some immediately. When the ice storm was here, they, overnight, they set up a place where people who could afford hotels could go there. You know, and it was in the suburbs. Yeah, mm -hmm. and half of the people even went there because they stayed where they were. And when do the homeless get the, re the recipients of that? After the thaw, and then there's such an influx that you can't handle it all because we don't have a refrigeration place to keep the way they are. So stuff that could be prolonged, we have to give it out immediately in the community, and, and it's not always handled in the best way. But they're appreciative to get it. But if you can do that much in 24 hours. Why can't you have done something 25, 30 years? And the city and county never had a handle on homelessness. No. Because I'll be willing to bet you in a 20 block radius, one in five homes have someone there that's not a member of that family. Mm -hmm. That doesn't include the encampment and the number of people that we deal with on a daily basis. So I would say that basically, I said this is a great last night in the meeting. It's a city-county problem to find a place of temporary provision for these people. And don't tell me there's not a place out there. It is. But they got this old crazy saying, not in my backyard. Mm -hmm. But my guess, those same people you were talking about not in your backyard, those are the people who are working with you, work with, enabling you to earn a paycheck to take care of your family, and they're getting zero in return. How do we resolve the problem? <coughs> I really don't know. I have ideas, but I think the city and county should come together and pull up a parcel that can at least entertain 40 to 60 people on a rotating basis. Because they're not going to—they're not going to all remain there. Some of them going to rotate out, and some of them is like anything else; they will always be with you. But at least you made a dent in the problem. And I think these other agencies. The case managers, they should draw them in and reevaluate their lives and what they're doing on a daily, on a weekly basis, and they should have to turn the reports on the person. Well, you know, it's Look at our Reggie that just died mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. in the fire. Reggie, oh, money was... Yeah, that happened on the street, right? Yes. Right here, yeah. His picture is up Reggie here. had been with us. That's Reggie up there. Reggie had been with us off and on for years and years and years. Everybody knows the Pat Helen on the corner. But in the meantime, when he died, he had thousands of dollars of the Catholic Family Center never untapped. And that's crazy, because whoever his case manager from there should have followed his lifestyle. Uh, the, the longest he's ever stayed in an apartment was one of my houses that I own on Wild Street. He stayed there for 52 months and never a problem. Then, it, then, the, then, it, then there was a fire, he got burned out. Everybody said Reggie started the fire. But he did. Reggie was here at the House of Mercy when the fire started. Mm -hmm. And the guy who started the fire, they had to rescue him off the second floor. The second floor. Second floor. Mm -hmm. So it, it just, it's just a label and the stigma they put upon certain people that really doesn't fit. Because they're listening to hearsay and not, they're not down in the churches to get to know the people the way we are. And, and, I, just, and I still say city and county has a responsibility to the resident and they're what they call the undesirables of the city because they're human beings mm -hmm. and I'm my guy ain't made no junk he make good people who do bad things but if he can forgive him 70 times 7 who is the city in the county not to say let's make provisions for them and let's call the people the task who's supposed to be overseeing well, if the city and the county were really interested, really concerned about the homeless and the issues that they face, they would do something. And it's a shame that we have to pick it up, pick up the problems and present them to the city and the county. In the New York State Constitution, Article 17 says, you know, uh, through, the, through the state, the county is responsible to take care of all the poor in the county, and they are not doing this. You know, so the very fact that we're asked to, to, to take the lead even in the um, Civic Center Garage homeless um, and we're willing to do that, 
but we told them that we need their help because number one we don't have the money for it and we don't need the money we don't have the money for the operation to, to support the building. Yeah. yeah you know um and um you know this housing first is a solution but it's not the it's not the only solution and it doesn't solve all people's problems like we were talking about what happened at sun house uh you can't just put people place people in apartments and say okay you're all set I think you know, all there's a follow-up what we're doing in housing first it can all come it can collaborate together wait go back to some, what's housing first i don't know if i've heard about this Housing. It, go ahead. They said taking a like a person to go in the garage, yeah. and they ten take ten people there, and find a landlord who will accept him. But landlords generally sympathetic, or no? That's not the best part of the job. Okay. Find a landlord who's sympathetic to the cause and move them in, accept them for the way they are. Okay. But I think it's more true than that. As sure. it, there has to be a follow up to the process. Uh, a person has to be almost. Uh, reincarnated for better cars work because you got to learn how to maintain a house you got to learn how to make allowances to buy groceries and etc and prepare for himself as laundry as, as doctors appointments and etc and probably have to be done with it so it's a lot with going making this all come together because some maybe one in ten will be able to say well okay you set you can handle that but the other nine people coming along they need to be walked through the system they need an income first. Yeah. So the first thing you have to do is help them to get an income. And then Medicaid and Medicaid and Medicaid and Medicaid and they can be. survive. Well, um, case in point, we took the railroad people. Yeah. I've been refurbishing the house which we own on, on North Street, which is Roy Croft. Uh, and it was finished just in time. <laughs> yeah, but, but I, hadn't, I hadn't even gotten to see a hole yet. <laughs> <laughs> so she called me, I'm moving these people. Wait, wait a minute, back up, no. And we argued, we argued, and I went down, and we moved them in. We got them income, <laughs> and if you Good go, thing I'm boss. <laughs> yeah, and we got them income, and if you go over there now and see the place, they didn't want to go there, but now they don't want to leave there. And so they're they're settled. Well, yeah. is, and you know the thing is, uh, when we had them come in, it was going to be like a wet house. We weren't going to tell them what to do. They can continue living the way they w lived and wanted to live. So we let them move in, and but we knew they, they had no income, so we had to get them Medicaid and food stamps, and then we helped them to get SSI. So they were getting an income, and now they can pay rent, and they're so happy there, they don't want to leave. No. And they did not want to go there. I, said, that, I said to them, I said, look, just come and look at it. Just see, well, they came, and they loved it. Yeah. And now they, they will not leave for anything. So, you know, and so the thing is, they can, if you take them where they're at, and work with them where they're at, and give them time. Yeah. It'll work out. And they take pride in it too. And they do. They take Can't pride. Can you say, look, come in, look, look, look how nice I keep my floor. Look how nice this is. Well, I had the pictures of before and after of a couple of them up there. How we didn't tell them to shave. We didn't tell them to take baths. We didn't tell them all that. But yeah. they did because there were showers there. There were tubs there. There was a stove. They ate, you know, and they shaved and uh, dressed up and took care of themselves and the transformation was was miraculous that's so great because like i've actually wondered what's happened to those folks they know they're they still there yeah they got moved out of that place and yeah then yeah and, and they're so used to being outside yeah. right you Coming know they, and going and yeah they would they would walk down to to the uh, downtown you, but they would come back and during this cold cold winter i was so happy they were in a house and they were too you know, they don't, don't have to worry about being out in the cold. They don't have to worry about how to have, what they're going to eat. They don't have to worry about their safety. But there's one of them that's still at large right now. What's his name? Um, he was he coming? Ryan? Jimmy? Not no, Jimmy. No, Ryan works with him pretty, pretty much. What's his name? Eddie, oh, was, Eddie uh, the one uh, that died. Uh, I know. Um, not Dave. But yeah. we come to find What's out that name? he had quite a history. Right now he gets two incomes. He one on the first. No, he gets on the third of the month, and he gets. He had a pension coming from a place that he didn't even realize, because he had work way back when. Oh my God! And he's out there now, but he, he's aloof, but he's financially stable. Yeah. He can do what he want to do, because he's getting something like sixteen hundred a month when he was getting nothing. Yeah. So he's sort of just doing his own thing. And yeah. Yeah. Well, he comes here once in a while, and every once in a while he goes over to visit. Jim and the other guys there, but yeah. and sometimes he's at the garage. Yeah, and sometimes he's at the garage, but he's—I mean—but he's 
living free. Yeah. But you, you know can't I mean? you can't force them. Right. right. And so we accept him just the way he is, but he does find shelter. He knows where to find shelter. Hang on. And he knows he's got friends. Yeah. yeah. And he knows he can always come back here. So just to go back to saying a wet house just means that, that, that they, they can, can live their can life come and go as they want. Come and go as they please. There's no restrictions. No. Right. Okay. No. But we, you'd be surprised. These guys in as much as they come and go as they want to well, Kenny of late had two heart attacks and he's not he, well, he, well he, he bounces back, I don't know why. And Jimmy, he drinks his natty daddy most of the day, but for the most part, he keeps his area nice. And if you go by, he's on the porch, you might be drinking a beer, might be with a neighbor, whoever, and he makes the rounds in the neighborhood. The neighbors love him. Yeah. And, um, and they were concerned about the neighborhood because yeah. it's a black neighborhood. Yeah. They were concerned about it, but they're welcome and they're friends and... They're getting along. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. And, yeah. and, you know, at some point, maybe one of these days, it's a great thing about it. You wouldn't believe that this, these are homeless people living in, in their surrounding yes. area, the way they maintain it and keep it together. Wait, and it sounds like this system of the way that you do things is completely different from the way that the exactly. county and the city system is. Exactly. Right? exactly. The, yeah. The exactly. sanctions and the points and the. You if they would give the people half a chance and accept them the way they are and work with them where they are, they'd have they'd be much more successful. Well, but you know you what? They lack compassion. We had they a guy that love. lived here. Abraham was here for fifteen, close to sixteen years. We had to find out his his name wasn't even Abraham. His name was Deverne Gamble. Come Did you get to the find newsletter? Out. I I don't, but I should. We got one on him in there up on the shelf. But anyway, he was with us close to sixteen years. We should get them the newsletters. Yeah, and now his name is Deverne Gamble. He just moved into uh, Pinnacle, uh, North Clinton, uh, South Clinton Goodman. He has his own place. I took him to get his driver's license. Um, then I took him down to take his five-hour course. Now he says he's going to buy him a car. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just totally changed around. And he's proud of who he is. You know, he found he thought he was from California. We find out he was from Alabama. <laughs> Do you know who worked very closely with him was Ryan? Yeah. And uh, wow. he he had been he was with us for about 14 years. Yeah. And could okay. get absolutely no help. Because he had no identity without that birth certificate. And that's right. the first thing. We're always scrambling to get people their birth certificates because they need that first. And he couldn't get a birth certificate because he wasn't known anywhere in the whole no, country. he wasn't. And, um, so security car wouldn't even match. <laughs> yeah, so Ryan worked very hard with him and he, for a while. Just He was determined he was going to get his birth certificate for him. And... Um, then he said he uh, checked the uh, with the with the police uh, public safety building. He which police and found he had a record. Was was a minor record, but yeah. they had his real name. Oh, wow. And with that, he was able to go to the, um, the social security office. But it was a fight. Even all the way, it was a fight. And Abraham is he's Devern Gamble now. Here he is, right here. And he is so happy. You see this picture. Abraham is the guy right there. That's when we went, took him out to dinner to celebrate. You know, See how happy he is? Wants. Yeah. So he's he to oh, yeah. yeah. To celebrate because he knew he he right. got his identity back. Yeah, exactly. And he's so happy over it. I asked him, I say, Abraham, what do you want to be called? Abraham or Deverne? He's Deverne, his real name. Yeah. Didn't even know he was Deverne Gamble for years. And he was in other shelters, and he was put out of other shelters. Yeah. And then he came here, and we kept him. He worked the truck for us for a while, volunteering to work on the truck. Him and Wallace is too. Well, Matthew Wallace is still with us too, but uh, and Abraham, you know, he was so unassuming of a guy. He was low key, mild mannered. Yeah. I saw him downtown, had. down on Main Street. I mean, he's getting around, taking the bus. I mean, he's li he's living a life now. He came here Sunday for, for mass. Yeah, yeah, I mean, he's <laughs> it's remarkable, but he's on his feet. That's going to be really uplifting for you guys to see oh these stories of people oh that are actually oh my gosh, yeah, getting their, get their lives together oh and are doing what they want to do. It was and, such uh, a joy. Yeah. And Ryan was so happy when finally you know, we were able to get that. But, yeah. but, but uh, Abraham, I mean, he just was elated. He finally knew who he was. And he lost his identity because he was uh, put out of the house, his family's house, by his sister. And he lost it. 
he, he lost it. So he just couldn't remember who he was, where he was from, right. and carried that throughout the years, you know. So I'm going to jump to another point that's sort of related. Um, it's not Christmas time, but at Christmas time, I always see the help the homeless, you know, yeah, feed the yeah, poor, yeah. put your $5 coupon with your groceries. Right, right. You know, people are always like, oh, buy a turkey dinner for House of Mercy or, you know. That's great. The, well, whatever, you know. Um, I'm just wondering, like, you know, uh, I know that homelessness is, is an issue that is year-round, right. yet it is promoted in such a way to think that only in the colder months it's an issue. I know. And Appreciate I'm wondering um, if you could talk a little bit about the struggles that people face the other three seasons of the year, aside from the winter. Well, the interesting thing is we get food and gifts and all that for Christmas, and it's wonderful, a wonderful spirit mm -hmm. of giving. But the day after Christmas, <laughs> and it's the end of the month, they might have gotten their food basket, but it's gone. Yeah. And so they're starting all over again, and they have to come back and ask for more food until the first of the month. You know, so it's wonderful to have that spirit of giving, um, but people are in need all year long. And we experience it with, with funds, because we get a lot of funds, you know, checks at Christmas, which is wonderful, but those checks carry us through the year. Because then, during the summer months, they kind of dry out, you know, and then we're struggling to survive on, on that Christmas money. So uh, the generosity is great, and we need that, and the people need it. Um, but it's a year-round poverty doesn't stop after Christmas. It's a year-round struggle for all of our people. Um, and they're grateful for any help they can get. But what we try to do basically is try to help people get on their feet. Um, but as we help homeless people to get on their feet, more are coming in, you know, so it's an endless... Um, well, it happens that way because we are probably the only agency in the city, no questions asked. Mm -hmm. You individual in front of me, what do you need? How can I help you? Other people, before they get to know the people, it's all the red tape and the bureaucracy in front of them. I mean, we I absorb think, the red tape. Yeah, we I absorb think it. <laughs> once before we did that to the guy someplace that had no ID. Okay, he might not have any ID, but he's a human being in front of you with need. And part of that need is helping him get his identity <laughs> if you don't have any. Because you got to have identity to get that identity. <laughs> so the system's kind of weighed backward. Well, it blows my mind when they ask for so, a birth certificate, and there is no birth certificate. Yeah. I know we try placement sometime uh, through the system. The night, the first thing you ask, do you have any ID? Well, no, but we're about to. Well, you need an ID. Before I can even consider letting you in this place. Yeah, yeah. you got it. <laughs> so now we're stuck with another individual because he can't go anywhere else because he have an ID. And I know the reason for it. The reason for it, Monroe County pays every other shelter around, they picks up the tab and the cost of that person. Mm -hmm. Well, fortunately, we've been operating and we don't need, we do need, but we don't get county yeah. funding or county right. money. And with the donation we get, we can deal with the way we see fit Thank to do. God. So we accept that individual as face value coming through the door. Then I find that if your hospitality is good, you make a person comfortable, let them relax, then they'll begin to open up to you. I don't know, you say you came through on a tour. If you did, you heard me tell the story of the person who stayed there for almost a year and a half, Gary, um. in the corner. And one night I was getting ready to go out before I got shot. And I said, I need a volunteer to go with me out to Pittsburgh. He said, I'll go. And from here to Pittsburgh and back, Gary talked about Gary, and he opened up. And one of the very things he said, this is the first place I've ever been that I wasn't pushed or rushed through. And we've got another story uh, with uh, Chris. Uh, yeah. He was here for one, over a, just a little over a year, yeah. and he was here at Christmas time. And yeah. uh, then he finally found a place and he was ready to go, and he came back to me and he said, Mr. Grace, he said, thank you so much for letting me stay here as long as you did. Over a year, he said, I needed that time. 
He said, I needed that time to come to grips with myself, and I saw how giving the house of mercy was constantly giving. He says, and I realized how selfish I was. Yeah. And he says, I want to thank you for not pushing me out and letting me stay as long as I needed to. Well, about, oh, maybe about half a year or sometime later, mm -hmm. there was a knock on the door, and it was him, it was Chris. He handed me an envelope and left. And I opened up the envelope, $1,000 was in there. And then um, a year later, he sent another check for $1,000 in yeah. gratitude for what he, but, but you, you know. know you the time you need. Right, yeah, yeah. right. And he comes around, he'll say hello, he remembers. Yeah. You know, he'll come by and see us. And uh, he said he got a settlement, he wanted, a se he wanted to share it with us. And that's where the money came from. But he remembered. Are you seeing more folks coming through House of Mercy with the current economic situation, oh, yes. the collapse from oh, yes. 2009? Oh, yes. Or and, seven, actually, I guess. Yeah. and actually, it's not always mental illness. People who have fallen through the cracks, uh, for whatever reason it might be. Sometimes it's uh, family disputes, and they come outcasts. Years back, we started to see children come, mm -hmm. which goes into the uh, camp, camp thing, issue. Um, and we saw a three-year-old and a five-year-old boy and girl uh, with their foster grandmother coming here every day, morning till night, every day. And I thought, something's got to be wrong that they're here all day long. Yeah. So when I checked it out, I found out that they were without electricity for one solid year. Yeah. And we told the um, child protective service workers, child protective workers, they said it wasn't serious enough to do anything. That's the system for you, right? So we paid to have the electricity restored, but there was so much damage in the year that it was very expensive. But we wanted to get them into their own home and comfortable because they have they came here to eat. I mean, they, they were doing everything here because they had no way to do it at home. No, right. no. So then um, the children um, got to a point where the five-year-old boy, he was five now, he didn't want to go back to the house. And every time we, he was, it was time for him to go back, his grandmother would come and get him, he'd hold on. He did not want to go home. And this went on for a while. And then one night, it was about 11 o'clock, we drove them home, and he sat in the car. He didn't want, want to get out. And crying, crying. I went home many times crying over this little kid. Um, and he says, uh, his grandmother came to get him, he says, come in with me. So I, went, I walked in with him, and he heard his aunt was upstairs. So he, we started to go upstairs, and the grandmother shouted, you can't go up there. With that, that little kid bolted out of the house in the dark and ran down the street. And I thought, oh my gosh, we've lost this little kid. He came back, got in the car, crying. And I said, no more, no more. He's not coming back to this house. So that night, he and I slept in my office. He was on two chairs. I was on two chairs. His grandmother came to get him. He didn't want to go. I said. He's okay with us, leave him alone, and she left him alone. And during the night he whimpered, and when I checked him out, he was crying in his sleep. And then he fell back to sleep, and later on he looked up to see if I was still there. From that point on, he never went back to that house. Um, and we have children coming, so uh, the, the children start, about three years, three or four years, three years ago, children started to come. Well, I had, some, I had a children, children summer camp for 10 years before I got shot, every summer. Okay. We had to get neighborhood kids and we would walk places and every Friday was a field trip. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the summer, I'd take the whole shebang to see Bree for a day. You know, so um, he wasn't, go he was five going on six now. And the children were not in school. And I said to the foster grandmother, I said, they should be in school. Well, they don't have to be in school until they're six years old. I ignored her, I put them all in the car, I went down to the city school district, found out what needed to be done to get them in school, got them in school. And the little kids love school. In fact, when the school year was over, he was in kindergarten, but he did not, he did not want school to stop. He wanted to continue going to school. And so what we saw was that once they're out of school, there's no structure there's in their nowhere lives. To go for them. Yeah, so yeah. what happens? They're going to be out in the streets drug dealers are out there, the drug addicts are out there, and you know what their future would be. And there was a concern for us. So that's when we started to look at, we got to put some structure in the kids, get them into summer camps uh, so that they're busy and not hanging out in the streets. So we consulted with um, uh, Camp Stella Maris, 
in the first we got 14 kids going to Camp Stella Maris in, in one week. And it was free. When did this start? Uh, what, what, Camp Stella Maris? Oh, well, like when did you start sending people there? Oh, this was three years ago. This is our third year. Three years ago. And so what happens is kids hear about kids going to get more and more come, <laughs> you know. And so um, we had we had um, Hank put in the newsletter, you know, we could use money because we we're using our money, our funds are low. But we spent the money sending them not only came to out Salem Mars, but this little kid that was with us, we sent him to four. He went to five five camps that summer, um, and we paid for we paid for it. But it was worth it to get him off the street. Right. And so every year now he looks forward to, to his, yeah. And then we have more kids going, more kids coming and saying they want to go to camp. And the interesting thing is that with the um, with Hank putting it in the newsletter, we are getting money. People are sending money for camp for children. And uh, just yesterday, I mean, checks are coming in. We got four thousand dollars plus for summer camp. So that doesn't eat into our funds, you know, at least we can send them to camp, we've got money for it, and we can still function. Um, but we'll, we'll risk. We risked spending that money for the sake of the children. And uh, we had one kid who was uh, going to public school. He was in fifth grade, and his mother came, and she was crying that she said he's not doing well, and she's like, she couldn't take it anymore, or something needed to be done. So I got him into Nativity Catholic School, and uh, so in sixth grade, he started in sixth grade, because they started in fifth grade there. He started in sixth grade at Nativity. We found out he was in sixth grade now reading on a third grade reading level. And that kid flourished that full year, one whole year in that school. He moved from a third grade reading level to a ninth grade reading level. And he's still there, he's a leader, and just really loving school, <clears throat> not missing school and his mother is so much happier. So we're getting kids, yeah. even with Hope Hall, we get children into Hope Hall. Um, we've got three, four, about five children <coughs> uh, placed where they should be placed. Um, and it's really helped them in their lives. Uh, they're making it a loving life and not wanting school to end. I mean, as they want to stay in school. It's really nice because, you know, I, I mean, self-education or just education through life is so vital. Oh yeah, well that's it. We you want know. them to become educated. Yeah. So so this way because we so the, the teachers are, in, are in, uh, in touch with us so that we go to all the teacher parent teacher conferences and we can see how the children are doing. We can Present. encourage them. Yeah. And it's wonderful to see the because there is great leadership. I found this out when I started working in the inner city. Great leadership <coughs> in the inner city. But so much of it is lost and wasted due to drugs and alcohol. And we want to save our children so that they have a future. Um, the one dream of the principal at, at, at um, Nativity is that this kid goes to McQuaid High School. So that's her dream. And they'll go tuition free. And that's the other beauty. When the scholarship we get, issue between the schools? Yes, something? you know how you have to pay tuition in most yeah. of these schools. But because we bring them in and uh, they're eligible, they're tuition free. Their parents do not have to pay their tuition. So it's been a wonderful thing that's happened. But we, you know, then the, is, what about all the other children? You know, you think about all the other children and you want to do something like the educational system, you know, in Rochester is deplorable. You know, and you wonder what can we do about that? Um, you know, that's a grave, grave, grave concern. So so that's a whole other beast. Oh, another yeah. whole thing, another right, whole, not, yeah. right, right, right. I was yeah, so wondering if you can give some updates on the building, the Civic Center, and the burial issue, mm -hmm. and then uh, maybe talk, I, I could re ask, but talk a little bit about what's going on with the legislature right now, and yeah. how is that battle working yeah. out? Okay. Uh, with the, um, the um, Civic Center garage, um, when we heard that they were going to be put out of the garage, and you know it led into one of the worst winters we've ever had, um, we were very concerned and we immediately went down to see the people in the garage and they were frightened. They were absolutely frightened, you know, they're going to put us out, where are we going to go? Uh, so we told the, the, the uh, county and the city through the LSD board to, you know, the, and the, the committee that would meet every other Friday, the homeless services pro uh, providers, uh, we told them, look, you cannot put the homeless out until we have a building. 
and we kept saying it and saying it and saying it. Then they were putting the responsibility for finding the building on us, you know. And I thought, well, this is a universe. This is everybody's problem, just, not just ours. So every time we we went out looking for buildings, when we went back to that committee, there was always the woman from the city, Carol Wheeler, always. Um, oh, we can't can't go in that building. Oh, there was always a problem with the buildings. So then it was going to be November. They were going to put them out. So we went met with the L L L S D L L D S board, yeah. and we went to meet with the owners of the garage and we said we said you can't put them out I said find a place for them or give us time to find a place so November they were supposed to be evicted and they weren't uh, uh, January 15th Martin Luther King's birthday they were supposed to be evicted of course our voices were right. raised and they didn't and then they said at the end of April they were going to be out and of course they didn't and um, we met with Judge Doran and we told him about the issue and we said, keep them there until we find a place. Also, people are saying there's an area in the Civic Center garage where they could really put them and it'd be no problem because the, the, the lower level at nighttime is not filled up, you know. So anyways, that, that's one thing. But we started to look, look for buildings and we still are looking for buildings. We thought we had some. But you know, right from under us, they're suddenly they're leased out or they're sold. And what we're what's really hitting us is the fact that we're talking about Center City, and Center City really means not in my backyard. They they won't come out and say it, but that's that's the, the issue. Uh, we did have a meeting with the city about the building on North Clinton. And they said, well, the zoning laws have to be changed. And they said, we were told that if we, we fought to get the zoning laws changed, then they would help us. But we thought, well, wait a minute, you're, so, you're the ones that are making these laws, so you need to help us. But we lost that building. So now we're still looking. We're looking all over, and we're not giving up on, on the chase, you know, to find the building, and we will find one. But in the meantime, we're watching the people at the garage go down, and we, we visit them. And they will ask us too. They know we're working to get a building for them. Some will ask, well, where are you with the building? But we've looked at many buildings and it is the thing of, well, we don't want them here. So this Civic Center garage, I mean, this uh, Center City equals- <coughs> Not in my backyard. Not in my backyard. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the, that's the issue that we have to confront. Where is that coming from? Like, is that business owners? Is it the city? Is that I think it's a city. people the with city. money? Is that what? Well, well, you know, they're building up downtown. Right. And uh, they're building these lofts, lofts, expensive lofts, and wealthy people are moving back in downtown. They don't want them around them. And the interesting thing is one place downtown on the interest street where they, they have these lofts, they have uh, new apartments and they're expensive. Right on the other side of the alleyway, in a little hovel, were homeless people. They yeah. don't even know it. There are homeless people living there. And then they say, you know, the St. Paul Quarter, you know, mm -hmm. uh, no, nothing there. But you know, the interesting thing is this, that's where Andrew's Terrace is. And yeah. we put our people, homeless people, <laughs> we move them into Andrew's Terrace. Right. So they're hanging out outside. And yet they're saying, well, no homeless people here. And yet they are there because we're putting them in homes and in, in apartments there. Um, we're, we're going to, there's an LSD meeting tomorrow, we're going to it, whenever they have their meetings to tell them, hold off, you, you've got to wait until we find a building, and then we are still meeting with the city and the county to say this is your responsibility, and we keep reminding them about uh, the Article 17 in the New York State Constitution. Um, we were told by a lawyer, don't you take care of their problem, because this homeless problem is theirs. Um, yep. And we want to bring a ticket to them, um, but you know what? If they really were interested, it would have been done a long time ago. And what about the burial situation? Well, we last talked. Uh, the burial issue. We keep going to the county. Money. We keep going yeah. to the county. Deaf ears. They do not want to hear about it. But we keep going to remind them that th this issue is there. Um, what were people are dying and they're coming to us, asking us for money. And they only get the funeral director gets twelve fifty, um, but what we're doing, we're we're working, we're talking to one. What we want to do is 
go to different um, funeral par directors and ask them if they'll come up with a set cost, a low, a low cost, uh, so that people could have a dignified burials, so they could have a wake, they could have uh, calling hours, they could have a funeral and the burial. And our issue is, you know, yes, everybody's saying, well, cremation is in, and maybe it is, but wealthy people have a choice. They can be cremated or buried. Poor people should have the same choice, and they're not given that choice. So it's a question of justice. You know, so but we're still fighting that issue. We're going to fight it. We're going to keep on. Um, we sometimes I'm thinking maybe the House of Mercy should have our own burial fund. You know, if people could donate to a burial fund, because we'll make sure it goes to the right cause for the right purpose. Right. Yeah. And the county, the, what bothers us, the county has the money. Look at all the fraud and the corruption going on in government. Well, and is it when we talked last about that issue? I remember um, I think it was 2012 or 13. Um, the the law firm who handled uh, Sally Green's case completely yeah. botched that. Oh, and they will not work with us now. Oh, I bet. Yeah, no. but they get a lot of bad press, and they were uh, getting like a write off of a hundred thousand dollars like a year. Oh yeah. Well, they, they had asked for the county, when yeah. we were asking. You no, know, when, when Maggie Brooks said, you know, cut the funding. I know the public administrator asked for eighty thousand dollars. She gave them a hundred thousand right. dollars. Yeah. And not only that, but you know, at the same time, at the zoo, they had the, um, the, um, what was it? There was a elephant. Yeah. Yeah, and they were going to embellish this, this, you know, the zoo for the elephants of four point one million dollars, and yet they wouldn't pay for burials right. for the poor. Right. Yeah. I, and I kept hammering, you know, the, the county legislature with that, but deaf ears, they don't want to hear it. They do not. And Maggie Brooks is just totally closed their mind and heart to this. But we still go, we still bring it up. But um, rec not too long ago when I was at the county lunch mm -hmm. um, and I was talking about all these issues, Anthony Danielli, Republican, was laughing. And I stopped. I stopped and I looked at him I said, there's nothing funny about what I'm saying, you know, about this issue. He smiles went back the following month, he laughed again. And I stopped dead in my tracks and I stopped. I said, there's nothing funny. And he still smiles. Now, when I talk, you know, they say two minutes, but I keep going beyond the two minutes. Of He's such a great, so yeah. you know, I would expect such things from you. Yeah. <laughs> so afterwards, I, last night I spoke to Jeff Adair. And I said, you know, Jeff, when his two minutes, you're, that bell is ringing, 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 ringing. But when Anthony Danielli laughs, and I have to stop and say, tell him if it's, it's not right for him to be let. You don't say a word. You let him laugh. I said, there's something wrong with that. And he says, oh, well, I guess I'll have to say something to him. <laughs> oh, but, but if they, if they, or if I see them talking, if I see them, you know, I'll stop. Like, like passing notes or texting. Yeah, and yeah, it's being yeah, fully yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll stop dead in my tracks yeah. and, I'll, and I'll, I'll, I'll call it attention to them, to the person yeah, that's doing that's it. That's great. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they, they're elected leaders, they should be... Exactly. And they should attention. be concerned about right. our issues. And they're not concerned about our issues. And we're trying to make them concerned about our issues. I was told, keep talking because they do listen. But, you know, we want to see action. Yeah. Um, and we've got to get, you know, the GRCC had a money, a barrel fund that's depleted. <coughs> um, so the county, the county has to help us, yeah. and we're not giving up on that fight either. <laughs> well, that's awesome. I have two last quick things. Number one, this raffle that you guys are doing to raise some money for the House of Mercy. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, that was CW's idea. It's a car raffle plus a garage sale, mm -hmm. plus uh, uh, dinner, plus a full pork dinner, full pork. Oh, wow. and and chicken barbecue uh, with green beans and potatoes, and we'll have we can order a great several sheet cake so that'll be a side dish which free goes along with the meal. Oh, wow. And those are all one part of it or those we're, are all individual We're things? doing it at, no, at Mercy, Mercy High School for the first time. Mercy High School. Uh, the garage sale will be from nine to five. The uh, the the meal will be from eleven to five. It's all one day. And the car raffle itself, we were talking about auction off the very same day but our ticket sales got out late. So we're going to be doing it 
at the end of the month there will be a drawing and I think they put an amendment to, on the website if the ticket sales were low it would run over into um, August but for the most part it's going to be the end of July will be the car drawing and, and if, uh, if people want to buy tickets or where do they go they to can go that? on the website House of Mercy yeah, yeah. Okay. and yeah. the car is going to be viewed um, it's going to be a marketplace on the is the marketplace the, on Eastview? Eastview on the 11th and the 12th of and July Yes. Okay. And, and also uh, at Tops. Uh, I don't tops. know. I don't know the date at Tops just yet. I think this weekend. Well, this I don't weekend. Know. I'll find out from Ashley. Or Ashley will let yeah. me know. Okay. But last night, I mean, she hadn't determined exactly what day it was yeah. going to be there. Um, this has to be a, a big uh, fundraiser uh, because we need the money. But it was Jim Volgo went to Mercy High School and asked them if we could use the high school. Yeah. And they agreed, and they have two gyms. Right yeah. across from each other. The new one they just built and the old one. Yeah, yeah, so the garage sale will happen in one, one gym, gym and then there's the atrium here and right. then the meal will go on in the other. Wow. Yeah. And on the day of the uh, garage sale on the 19th, there will be a car displayed there also. And we're setting up on the 18th and we're getting yeah. donations, you know, so um, we're hoping it will be a great success because we really need that money. It's probably the biggest fundraiser. If it's successful, it would be the well, biggest fundraiser. There's, there's, there's a lot of glitches this time getting it off the ground, but I'm hoping that the following year and years to come, it's our first time. We'll, we'll be we'll, we can perfect we'll, it we'll a get little the bit more. Worked out exactly. Yeah. 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 We realize now we should have started earlier. Um, right. Like we have a Christmas dinner dance. You know, there's a fundraiser too. We bring our people to this one. But we start. Uh, but we start too late. We start next so our, we're learning. You know, you really have to start earlier. Yeah. Um, um, so we're hoping this is a great success. Uh, will give us the money to take care of our people. And then lastly, what can people do to help you guys out? Money first. Okay. Yeah, we need money desperately. But well, um, we also, I think Ash just put together a wish list that uh, is going to be also on our website. Okay. And so check out the idea. website. That yeah, it's going to They're going to be at the, where the cars are yeah. being displayed too, but, uh, where the car uh, is being displayed. And I need this in our wish list. Uh, a copy that's going to be put on the website. Uh, some of the things that we basically need at different times, especially items that we need for uh, putting people in their home for the first time, home uh, residents, and also uh, any other kind of needs that we, a practical or personal need we need immediately. Uh, like a lady, as a matter of fact, I just put the name on the, on the, on the high chair, lady needs, and we itemize those out and give them to people because they can't afford to buy them yeah. and and, it, and we can always use appliances and things of that nature because most people are, are mm. no, no refrigerator no stove and some washer dryer washer dryer and yeah. things of that nature you yeah. know sometimes our people are just content to have a bed and a tv yeah. i mean that's how poor they are they don't yeah, have that that's the know. basic but Though I mean, that's basic yeah. um but you know uh, many times people come their shoes are all worn out and then, and we need we need shoes, sneakers, large sizes for men. In the winter time, we need the heavy jackets from one X to five X. Um, but you know, we need uh, hygiene items, a lot of deodorant, toothpaste, um, shavers, um, and blankets because we need blankets here for our people, but also blankets for people when they move into apartments, uh, and sheets and pillows and all. So anything that you need in an apartment in a house basically is what we need for our people. And we're taking our homeless in, in the neighborhood, and people come to us for things, but then when the homeless go into apartments, we have to help them. So it's a continuous yeah, need. It's like TVs, um, since flat screen come into effect, we get an influx of the other TV, and it's a luxury to our people, because they don't have TV at all. Right. Yeah. And I'm still, I still have one. In my house, I got that still old big Trump TV. Cause I, yeah, <laughs> I, I, do. I, I don't watch that much TV anyway. So I mean, uh, we the need news and, and socks. And so on, so socks on. always socks, winter and summer. But in the winter, in particular, we need the heavy, mm -hmm. the heavy socks. And when we went down to the garage or in the winter, we were taking socks down to them all the time. Yeah. You know, um, yeah. and boy, they really, they really needed them and used them. Um, but heavy jackets in the winter time. You know. What I learned from when I was in the military that if you take care of your feet, this is one of the most important things, especially in the holiday year, you got to change your socks daily. You know what I mean? And I see people when I go down to the garage, they wear two and three pair 
-hmm. and they think it's saving the feet, but it's actually a bother to the feet mm -hmm. because there's too much moisture that doesn't get air and you yeah, start yeah. to peel and before you know you got to like feet. And, and that's what happened to Abraham, by the way. Oh, we see his feet and yeah. wash him every day. And uh, now his skin pores just doesn't breathe and it looked like it had been burned, but he's not. It's just lack of oxygen. And you got air. it, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. We go down, we go down to the garage, and there, there are the groups that go down to bring food and do medical. I give them the medical help, which is good. Uh, we find they really love sandwiches and, and something. We always take water down, um, you know. But, you know, what they need is what we need. <laughs> and what people out there need, we need here for our people, you know. So it's a, it's a continuous need. Um, but clothing, uh, and now even newborn babies, you know. Um, so it's we were, somebody came in and needed we didn't have them and then after she left somebody brought a high chair in and we were hoping yeah. she'd come back and finally she did I, yeah. I held it in this in my office for her but you know people don't have bassinets they don't have high chairs they don't have the basic things no babies. no they don't you know, have last week we picked up a load of stuff it's supposed to be for garage sale and i was putting it in the storage garage and ladies and of course she is that's such a beautiful baby bed. I wish I could have it for my kid. And I know we're saving for garage, so I didn't have the heart to tell her no. I said, well, look, you can have it. Yeah, well, you she do. She said, well, I have no way to take it home. So I asked Jeremy, no, I asked Jeremy to leave it in, I asked Jeremy <laughs> leave it in our house for the next day, in your house, you can come get it from there. If you don't, let me know. I'll have, to, I'll have to pick up truck, bring it over. But it's just the norm. Yeah. People who don't have what they see and they don't, after a while, what public at large call greed. It's not greed. I don't call it greed at all. It's like I've always been with bare bone necessary. And when I see something nice, it's a parent's desire to have their kids sleep in some of the best. If it's humanly possible, even though they can't afford it, they would like to have it. So yeah. that's one of the things I find that House of has offered people over the period of years. For the next 20 some years that I've been with, I know that um, we, when I, when I first came aboard to visit her, which I'm still visiting. Uh, <laughs> 27 years ago. <laughs> she says to me, um, We move here to help people to live in dignity, we find them to die in dignity. But by the same token, I found that uh, a neighborhood who had been malnourished, and I don't, I don't mean just the repeated people in need, I mean some of the regular people who live in the residence, the third and fourth week of the month, they have a balanced meal because of what we serve <coughs> right. and give them. Yeah. And, yeah. and see now they're, they're looking better, they're feeling better. Some are living longer, some are dying early, but for the most part, we take care of a decaying community, part, give it a life to it. Well, we got involved in the burial issue because people were dying. Right. Oh my gosh, and I, did I tell you a story about this one up here? Uh, maybe. The one. Woody, way at the end, the first one. Woodrow Pugh. Maybe, yeah. Well, well he, he was homeless, and we were in Central Park. He was homeless. And so he was with us, and we got him an apartment, got him into the apartment. But every night he came back to sleep. Oh, I think you did something yeah, about this. Yeah, yeah. And it was because, and this is true of people, they move out of here, they, they miss back. the camaraderie, right. the friendship, you know. Um, and so then we took care of his funeral, you know, and then his, the mother of his children, they were both in their 50s, she said, um, she said, she always worried about Woody dying on the street all alone. Mm -hmm. And she was, in her grief, she said, I'm so happy. Then when he died, he died in the House of Mercy, surrounded by friends. He passed here. And this was in the house on Central, Central Park. Park. Oh, Central Park. Okay. He, he okay. one night he, he he was coming every night, but one night morning he didn't wake up. And he, the people in the streets all came in to see him. And know. he had money in his pocket. He wasn't broke. Yeah. <laughs> it was just he, he really enjoyed and appreciated yeah. the atmosphere. Oh, well, he yeah. tripped me when I first moved. That's right up in Grace. I come in one day. He said, my buddy from the Army brought me this food. Will you cook it for me? <laughs> he was funny. He got a dishonorable discharge from the Army. and we Because we were trying to get him his veterans benefits. Yeah. We said, well, you got a dishonorable discharge. I did not get a dishonorable. <laughs> I was a soldier. <laughs> he was my so funny. My friend came to see me. So I cooked so the food. So funny. And the guy, I think it was Keith, coming that day and says, 
who cooked my food? I said, well, Woody told me he brought it from, this guy brought it from the military. He raised gas, well, look, it's enough for everybody. Why don't you guys just share it? <laughs> and so I would, I don't mind sharing with him, but it's my food. <laughs> it wasn't his at all, it, it was Keith's food. Oh, he was so, he was so funny, you know. Um, but we had several stories where, you know, they didn't, um, when someone died, you know, we were able to find the family. They hadn't seen them in years. Yeah. You know, we had several stories. Like so we got into the uh, burial issue because it was a need. And we opened this up, you know, when I first submitted the proposal to Sisters of Mercy, and it passed 20 to 20, 20 to and 4 were opposed. And one of the sisters that was opposed said to me, well, what if it doesn't work? And I said, well, let's give it a try. You know, I had never done anything like this before in my life either, you know. You know, so, so I just thought. You're looking at Woody back then. I'm saying we got two because that's one of Woody just over there. Oh, you know, you know what happened? Somebody, somebody took them down and then put them oh, back, back up. up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, anyways, when we opened the House of Mercy in the first month, over and people flooded to the House of Mercy. All I could think of was, you know, the words of their sister. What if it doesn't work? Yeah, you, know. you are. Yeah. 27 years later. Yeah. Yeah. yeah still here. Well, thank you both for your time today. This well, thank you for generous. coming. And, I, and we got another birthday coming in October. October. Yeah, 29 another, years old. Yeah. October 1st. Yeah. So next year will be our 30th. Wow. She, was, she was two years old when I joined in. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Keep saying that. <laughs> when you force serfs to work your plantations, that's what started your class war. Disney sweatshops full of Haitians, that's what started your class war, Bernie's billions and Worldcom fraud.